going to be a little bit of an exciting one. We're going to be making a double bed. Now, I'm going to be making this for a client. Their current situation is they've had a loft conversion and the room underneath the loft conversion has a little alcove where the stairs goes up into the loft. And there's currently a bed in there. And at the moment, it's quite a dark space and the bed's quite high. So the idea behind this bed is it's going to be a lower bed and it's also going to have some backlighting around the headboard to make it a little bit more pleasant to sleep in. So, before I began, I designed a bed out on a 3D CAM package called SolidWorks. That's allowed me then to get an accurate cutting list drawn out of all the parts I'm going to need with the accurate sizes and quantities. I'm then going to mark out using my measuring tape and a tri-square accurately to all the lengths I need, double check and get them cut over on the mitre saw. Before I start measuring, I'm going to need to decide which is my face side of my board. Now an easy way of doing that is if you slide down the board and you're looking for your straightest edge. Because this has come from a really good timber merchant, both edges are pretty straight, so I'm going to decide this side without any knots on is going to be my face side. And this is the side we're going to be doing all our marking out from. So I've squared the end of the board, so I've already trimmed that on my mitre saw to make sure I've got a square edge to work from. And I'm going to be measuring and I'm going to be doing a line across with my tri-square. Now I'm going to label this so I remember which part it is. And I'm going to shade the waist side of the line, so the side I'm going to be cutting on. Just to remind me when I come round to doing the sawing. So I'm going to need another one of those. And what I tend to do as soon as I've marked out a part, I'll tally it. Then when I cut it, I'll do a separate tally so I know that those parts have been done. Got all my parts accurately marked out and I'm ready to cut. Now if you want to make this project at home to make it easier so you can follow at your own pace, I'll try and attach my CAD drawings along with an accurate cutting list that you can work from to make this project. So compound mitre saw then, I've got an Evolution Rage 3S, fantastic budget saw, originally bought it a couple of years back to cut some PVC pipes for my lathe storage and I pretty much use this every day. It's a superb saw, it's still got exactly the same blade as I bought the saw with after three years, which is really good, and this saw can cut through wood, metal and plastic. So if you're using reclaimed wood like pallet wood, you can cut through those nails without messing up the blade. I've got my Southern Yellow Pine all the way from America for my legs, and I'm going to be cutting these up next. So I've got a little laser beam there that's been calibrated to cut exactly on the line so I'm going to move that slightly a little bit away from it cutting on my waist side so I get a nice accurate cut so for this you are going to need some year defenders and goggles and some dust extraction <laughs> size now the next step we're going to be doing a little bit of marking out ready for our mortise and tenons so the idea behind this is our legs we're going to be drilling holes and chiseling out a mortise groove and we're going to be cutting tenons then into our crossbeam boards that should go into the legs and that'll give us a really structurally strong wood joint we're going to measure the width of our legs and these are 70 by 70 millimeters we're going to half that, so 35. And we're going to come from the edge of our board and we're going to put a little dot at 35. We're going to then use our tri square to score that line across our entire piece. Then let's take off 20 millimeters either side. And we're going to score these lines across then with our tri-square. Now the idea behind this is we're going to be removing these little square sections. 
And what that will give us is a little slot inside the leg and a little shoulder then that will sit against the leg. So essentially, it will be up against the edge like this, a little slot then chiselled out for that to fit onto. So we need to do exactly the same now on our headboard pieces, obviously on a bigger scale, and we're going to do this for either side of all of our parts. So it's exactly the same measurement across from the edge, which is 35 millimetres in this case. Obviously, if you were to use different thickness square blocks, then you can adapt the sizes to meet your own needs. Line across with my tri-square. And I'm going to do the same distance either side again, so 20 millimetres. And that should give us quite a chunky tenant then to go in. Using my tri score again to mark these lines. Oh, there you go. And I'm shading the bits I don't want. So again, these two corner bits. I'm going to be cutting those away. Now, how am I going to cut these? So there's several ways of doing this. I could use a traditional sort of tenant saw to do this. I could use a jigsaw, bandsaw. So there's a number of different ways I could do it. So I'm going to use a jigsaw just because I have one in this case. And it just makes a quick job of these. Now, an important thing we need to note is that this edge here it needs to be perfectly square so I'm going to be setting up a little jig for my jigsaw to help me do that. So what I've done is I've probably made the world's most simplest jig I've clamped my board to the tool bench and I've clamped a block of wood across at 90 degrees so I've used a tri-square to make sure that's perfectly at 90 and I've set the distance of this block from my the wall jigsaw from where the blade's going to be cutting to the edge of the jigsaw fence. So that should help us get a perfect 90 degree line across. And I've got my tenant cut out then. So I need to do this on all my blocks, ready to go into the legs. Right, how to mark out the mortise. So we've got a tenant's cut, an easy way of doing it. If you extend these lines just there and there where the shoulders end, you can put your leg against those. So what I tend to do is I'll look at the most attractive grain side and I tend to have that facing towards the front. So I'm going to do that towards the front. I'm going to line this up with the edge of the board. So the end of the legs come in nice and flush there use my finger as a gauge and I'm going to transfer these lines onto my block and that's a really accurate way of doing it. Another way you could do is measure that down with a rule and same from the bottom and transfer your measurements onto the board but I find that this tends to be more accurate for me as I do it. So you're going to score those lines across then with a tri-square We've got those lines scored across. The next thing we're going to do is find the center point. So I can use my rule and half 70 is 35. Put a little dot at 35. We do that from either end. 70, 35. Now we're going to measure the thickness of our boards. And in this case, it measures in at be 18 millimeters double check yeah 18 so I'm going to divide that by 2 so half of 18 is 9 and I'm going to measure 9 millimeters either side of this dot I've just done now I could get my rule and draw lines across there now the traditional way of doing this would be to use a what was intended marking gauge. There's two little points on here you set and you just score that across the edge. So not everyone has those so I thought I'd show you another way of doing it. You can even use your finger as a gauge and draw a line across like this or you could get your 
rule and line the dot to dot the dot. There you have it. Right. This central piece then, that needs to be drilled and chiselled out to half the depth of this block, which happens to be 35 that we've cut our tenants to. So, a couple of ways we can do this. First, the traditional way, we could drill a series of holes in the block all the way down to our depth. Then we can use a series of mortise chisels to chisel out this groove. A modern alternative, we can use a mortise machine. Just so happens I have the, one of those in work, so I'm going to use my mortise machine to cut these out. In theory, all of these should fit together nicely, but what I tend to do, and it's a good practice, is do a little witness sort of mark, so A to A, and when you come in to put this together, you're not gonna get confused which bit goes where, or frustrated if you take it more off, if it's too tight, etc. So that's a nice little tip of making assembly smoother. So I've now got A sorted or marked out, and the other end of the board, I've got B all sorted marked out. Next thing I tend to do, even though I'm using a mortise machine, I'm gonna use a knife to score the edges. So I'll use a steel ruler and a knife to score these edges, and what will happen is it's less likely to chip out then. Um, if you're going to do the traditional method anyway, you tend to do this as that will give a registering point for your chisel to go in anyway. So the next step is we've got the front all sorted. We're going to do the back panel now. Right, so the back piece then. From the bottom, I'm going to measure up 300 millimetres and I want my most attractive grain pattern on the front so 300 little dot at 300 use my tri square to square that line across and I'm going to flip it to the side and draw that line across the side so that's 300 the length of our front legs as well next step then I'm going to be Lining this up with the end of our tenant joint, so that 300 line is right at the end of the piece there. I hope you can see. I'm going to transfer these lines across. Top of the panel, we're going to line up with the very edge again, using our finger as a gauge, and we're going to be transferring. The lines from our edge of our tenants onto the side like so and we're going to be using our tri square to score those lines across again we're going to find the centre point at 35 measuring this time I've measured the thickness of the boards and it's actually 10 millimeters uh, sorry 20 millimeters so we're going to need to measure 10 millimeters either side double check my measurements across in the middle to make sure yeah spot on 20 spot on 20 wait that's good so I'm going to shade these in just to remind me, I'm going to be removing this a little bit. And again, just to make our references nice and easy, I'm going to call this one F, F, G, G. So when I come to putting these together, they're all going to fit up nice and easily. <laughs>
Okay, so we're going to need to remove the leftover debris in there from the mortise machine. So the way we're going to do that, grab our chisel, go to the end of our board, and the chisel itself I've got is a little tiny bit smaller than our gap. Just going to knock this all the way around. Try and keep your hands behind the blade. And we've got a smooth bottom now for our mortise. The next stage then, we're gonna do some biscuit jointing. So I've got my biscuits, and what I've done is I've marked an equal distance all the way along, and I've laid out my biscuits where they're going to be to make sure I had enough. So we're going to biscuit joint these, put the biscuits into place and glue the two boards together. And I've got a pile of clamps over there ready to go. And so I've got my Erbauer biscuit jointer here. Uh, the way these biscuit jointers work, so I've turned the power off so it's nice and safe to show you this. But we've got a rotating disc then. And that's going to be cutting out like a half crescent moon shape into a plank and we're gonna insert some biscuits. And the reason we do this is it helps keep the planks together as it's gluing. So I've clamped them to my workbench and I've got my little witness line there. And on this biscuit jointer, they've got a little red gauge mark there. And the idea is I'm gonna cut all of these and line them up with the other side. Let's give them a go. So I've got all my rail clamps set up to the right size, so we won't have to panic then as soon as the wet glue is put onto the boards. So we're going to glue these all together. So what I've done is I've just quickly clamped either side, and that makes it nice and easy then to glue. So I'm just going to do like zigzags going across, and I'm going to spread this out. Right, so we've got a mortise and tenon, so hopefully it makes a little bit more sense now. So chisel out the mortise, nice clean joint, and it's quite tight as well. So not going all the way unless I'm going to knock it in with a mallet, which is exactly as we want it to be. So as soon as this joint goes together, it's not coming apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply some Gorilla Glue down in the slot. A little bit on the sides, let it run down. That'll be more than enough in there. We're also going to apply some glue to the shoulders. So these part of the shoulders, and that's the bit that's going to be touching the edge of our wood if we've done everything right. Okay, so I'm making sure that I've got B and B matched up together. Putting them on the top there. Now, on the floor, got a block of wood so I'm not knocking into the concrete so I'm not going to chip this and I'm just going to use my joiner's mallet to lightly tap him on. Good. Again any sort of squeeze out I'm just going to blend in with my finger. That's good. Right, I can do exactly the same on the other side. Whip. So we're going to put glue into our mortise again, for part A. Yeah, lovely stuff. And we're going to put glue onto the shoulders again. Now I was originally going to do something called draw boring for these, where it entails drilling a dowel hole to draw in the joint, but I've got these pretty tight and I'm quite happy with them. so we're going to just put these on. Right, a point to remember, please make sure when you come to glue that you've got both of these legs facing the same way, not in opposite, opposite directions. <laughs> Done that in the past. Right, so we're gonna knock this down. Again, with a joiner's mallet. Okay. Good. 
And you see how cutting that perfect 90 degree shoulder there, you've got a lovely straight joint. Right, so it's the next day and this has been gluing up overnight. I've just taken the clamps off and it's glued up a treat. Now a little woodworking tip, if you're doing any gluing, what you can do is add a little bit of paste wax to the parts you don't want glue over spilling too. So for example, I've glued the seam and I rub paste wax over the top of the seam before gluing it together. And what's happened then is the glue set on the wax and you can actually peel that wax off then it's dead easy. So it saves you hours then of resharpening your tools after planing that hard glue. So I've just peeled that wax off with my fingernails and I'm ready for the next step which is to plane the seam. Now I'm going to use my old antique plane to do this. So I'm going to plane down that seam, get the boards nice and level and the next step then is the exciting bit. So I intend to draw a nice free flowing sort of curved line along the top and I'll get a router and cut out to the half the depth of this board and the intention is as I'm going to do a little bit of resin casting. Uh, I'm going to mix in a blue pigment and resin cast this backboard. Now there's a guy called Johnny Brook on YouTube, he's got a fantastic uh, channel called Crafted Workshop and I suggest you highly recommend you check him out because he's inspired me to do this style of headboard. So next step then planing and routing. <laughs> comparison I've done one side with a traditional sort of antique joining plate and the other side then I'm going to do with my electric planer my DeWalt electric planer I'm going to set the depth and we'll compare the two then now between the two then pretty much do exactly the same job obviously this one takes a little bit more time in setting up so finding the sweet spot to get the blade cutting little nil knob on the top there you can twist makes it nice and easy to set the blade depth however this is dead noisy so I think your neighbors would probably appreciate the old-fashioned one a bit more but it's far more versatile I, I think the DeWalt one is than the old antique one so I'm going to take into consideration if you're thinking of buying an electric planer. Right for the next step we're out in the garden for the routing so I've got my router set up with a quarter of an inch router bit there and I've got a power respirator and these are fantastic if you haven't come across these before I'd highly recommend them this one's a power capped active pro and I wear this all the time in the workshop, especially if I'm doing wood turning with tropical hardwoods. They've got two filters there that filters out all the, all the bad dust. So I'm going to put this on and some year defenders. And the idea is I've drawn out my pattern. I'm going to router out to the half the thickness of this board next. Right, got it all routed out now, so the grooves are in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a Whitley knife just to clean up around the edges. So any curves I'm not quite happy with or any bits the router's missed, I can sort with that. Alternatively, you could use a chisel. Then I'm going to get a bit of sandpaper, sand along the edge and the surface ready for the casting. Now before I cast, I'm going to use my Camvac and my 
air compressor to blow out any dust or debris because you will see that in your casting if that's not taken out. Next thing we're going to do is blowtorch all our pieces of work and cut that back then with a wire brush and add a lime wax over the top. So if you want to see this, how this finish is done, you can watch my wood turning a pine bowl scorching and lime wax video and it sort of goes through that in more depth so we can get on with that. Okay, got all the pieces lime wax. I've got my leg on the floor then. So I'm going to drive in all the tenants into the mortises, like the front leg, to secure them into place. So we've got our tenants then poking out. What we're going to do is add some glue where the boards are going to be touching the leg. So wet to wet, all the parts that are going to be touching. And we've got the fun part now of trying to get these all lined up and hammered into place. Right, there we go. Good fit. Right, we're going to let this set overnight, glue it properly, then we're going to come back in the morning and get this resin casted and assembled all together. Right, next step then we're going to be cutting our battens for the bed. So the idea behind these is we're going to screw them into the sideboard, so whack a load of holes, screw them so they're attached and eventually the slats can go across this batten to support the mattress. Now this is a little bit too chunky at the moment so I'm going to be cutting this down on my table saw which happens to be an Evolution Rage 5S. The reason I love this saw so much for a small workshop, you've got a little button there you press on the side and it will literally fold up drag it out of the way and it's got such a little footprint then so you can work on bigger projects like beds in this case. So we've cut all our battens to size. In this case it's 20 millimeters wide, 50 millimeters thick and the length of our sideboards. Next thing I've done is I've marked out some spaces where we're going to be drilling through. So I've done five inch gaps in between each of them so that should be probably more than enough to attach it to the sideboard with a bit of glue. We're going to be drilling and countersinking using one of these. If you haven't come across these before, it's a drill and a countersink bit all in one. Saves you so much time. Wish I found them years ago. Right, I've got my side panel now down on the workbench. And I've started to make things a little bit smoother. Pre-put all the screws into the batten. Now, to make the gluing process nice and easy, what I've done is I've added some Gorilla Glue into a roller applicator. So I'm going to roll that glue all the way along and then we're going to screw this into place. We're going to start off with the end screw, the other end screw, then work then into the middle. Right, we're getting very close to the construction stage of finally putting this bed all together. I'm going to attach next the side panels to the legs, the front and back. In order to help me do this, I've got some of these brackets. So I typed in on Amazon uh, bed brackets, and these were heavy duty ones, so they should do the job really well. And the idea of it is that this gets attached onto your leg, this attaches onto your side panel, and they slot together and lock into place. So they should be right nice and sturdy for what we need. And you can tighten these screws off to hold it all into place. So we're going to put our brackets right there at the top of the corner. So we're using the edge to square it off and the top to square it off. We're going to drill some pilot holes in first. I mean, it's a good idea to do this, otherwise you're going to be splitting your wood. If these aren't in place with your screws. And what this will do then is we're going to attach these onto the side and they slot and lock off into place. Right, so we've got the side piece now square to the edge and we're going to drill some more pilot holes in our side bracket. So a way of 
making sure this doesn't move around. We can tighten these two little nuts there and that'll keep that nice and secure and in place as we're drilling. On the back leg then with the headboard, all we need to do is do the same distance then for these brackets again. So 30 centimetres up in this case, that's the same size as our front leg. We're going to line that up with the edge again and do exactly the same thing again. So we're attaching the back ones now. We'll do the same again, lined them up, I've tightened these down, got that level with the edge, making sure it's nice and flat all the way along on the other side. Right, so we've got the central support beam. Now we're just going to put an L bracket onto the back of it to connect it to the front and the back of the bed. So as we normally do, we're going to drill some pilot holes in this. Right, so we've attached our middle beam. The next step, we're going to attach the middle block. And what this will do is it'll stop the middle beam from bowing and stop the slats from bowing as well. It's going to add a little bit of extra support. So in order to attach this, we're going to be using our drill with the countersink drill bit, four holes, and we're going to be driving in some rather beefy wood screws to hold it into place. Also going to be using, again, a little bit of Gorilla Glue to secure this permanently into place. Put it into place, and what I've done to make this easy to make sure I've got it accurate as so I've used my tri-square to score lines across and I've measured my center point as well across so I'm just placing this into place put some downwards pressure and I'm going to drill my four pilot holes so I've just put the slats across that I cut at the very start of the project in my cutting list and they seem to be fitting really nicely uh, something I didn't anticipate was this corner here so what we're going to do is we're going to cut out a little square there so this will sit flush against the end. I've already marked out on the other side so that shaded square we're going to remove and that board will sit perfectly flush up against the edge there. Right with the last step we're going to go traditional and cut it out by hand using a tenant saw. This goes to show you don't have to use power tools for everything, it just speeds things up a little tiny bit. So in theory the whole project can actually be done using just hand tools. We'll do that on the other four. So I've got all my slats in place now, and what I've done is I've put my slat across, measured where it needs to be, used a tri square to get this squared off, and in order to help us put this together, I've drilled two countersink holes so the screws will be nice and flush with the surface. And to remind us where they need to go, I've labelled each slat. So I've done some markings and labelled each slat where it needs to go, so we can take this apart and assemble it in the client's house. For the next step, I actually had to use a bit of GCSE math. So Mr. Davis maths, if you're still alive, I'm very sorry. So what I've done is worked out the area. So I've got that in millimeters cubed. And I've then looked at how many milliliters go into a millimeter cubed, and it's 0 0.001. So all you need to do is find out your area, divide it by that, and it'll give you the milliliters you need for your resin casting. And I suggest you use a tiny bit more than you need and have a little box left over that you can cast into, because it's always good to have more resin than you need, because some of the resin will seep into the sides, maybe the end grain of the wood. Plus it'll also give you a little bit left over so you can do things like pen casting. So I've looked at the manufacturer's instructions, it's given me all the correct ratios I need in order to help me do this. So I'm going to start off with my clear cast resin and I'll be adding the catalyst in later on. So you have to get the measurements as accurately as you can for this because it's really going to pay off in getting your casts in to go nice and smoothly. So it pays to get this nice and accurate because it's going to mess up your ratios if it's not perfect. Right, the next thing we're going to do is add a catalyst. Now this is a, a chemical reaction, this is a thermal reaction, and this is going to essentially make this resin into a plastic when it's set. So I've got my catalyst there, 
And in order to get this nice and easily to the right ratios, I've got a little syringe. So I'm gonna have to put in seven of the syringes to make sure I've got the right ratio to mix up. I'm gonna mix this in. I've got a little dowel ready to mix this up. I'm also gonna add some blue pigments. So we're gonna add a tiny bit of this at a time to see how it's going to look. So I've given that a little bit of a, a stir just to make sure it's all together. And we're gonna start adding little droplets of this in. Now it's got a little pet type cap on there. So you can do little tiny dots. What I suggest you do a tiny bit at a time. Do a few dots, mix it in, then see what sort of colour you're getting. Nice light blue already, only with those few dots. So you don't want to really squirt this in loads, otherwise you're going to get a darker colour. You can do a few more because I want a darker bit. So any sort of wispy bits in there, so like deep colour bits you can see that aren't blended and you want to keep stirring until those are all blended nicely. Now that's the colour of blue I was hoping to go for. So the next step is always the messy bit. We're going to be pouring this now into the little router groove we've made. Now I've got some kitchen roll at the ready to make sure any spill outs I can mop up quickly. For this step, we're outside, and that's because we're in a well-ventilated area. We've got some gloves on as well. This stuff's horrible on your hands. So this could be the messy bit. So we're going to start off in the centre. It's better if you have a jug to do this, to be honest. But we're going to give it a go with this. And the idea is to try and get it up to the height that we've... Now, over pouring this slightly because you will get some shrinkage, so it will shrink in slightly as it starts to go into a gel and then to set. For the leftover stuff I've got, what I'm going to do is I've got a little ice cream pot that's been cleaned out. I'm going to pour it into there and I can use that for some pen casting then. Last sort of step then, a little tip I've picked up over the years in doing sort of resin casting. If you get yourself a heat gun, you can just go over the top. And what that tends to do, any air bubbles you've got in your casting, it'll bring them to the top, they'll pop, and you're more likely to get a clear cast then as a result. Headboard is exactly level, so I've got my spirit level out and I've put some shims in the end just to make sure it's spot on. So hopefully everything will go right, we've used the correct ratios. It's just a nerve wracking bit now of waiting to see how this turns out. Final last step, we're going to add some LED backlighting then to the headboard. Now I've gone into Amazon and ordered an LED strip kit. So the LED rolls in there, uh, it comes with a plug, an adapter to your LED strip. And it also comes, which is really cool, with a remote control. So the you can set the different colour moods or brightness and such. So that's going to be really exciting for the client to have in that little alcove. And looks like we've got some connector blocks as well to extend the set out. So we're going to undo all this, attach it to the back and we'll do the final shot. Now by far the most easiest way of attaching these LED strips to the back of this headboard is to use a staple gun. I've got one here with me ready to go. And I find that these self-adhesive strips won't stick to the wood because we've done the blow torching technique and we put wax on this as well. So it's a nightmare for it. So we're just going to do a staple every couple of inches and that should help hold this on nice and easily into place and for a very long time. The bed is 100% complete and really happy with it. I hope the client's going to be as happy as I am. I've just finished the resin casting and the backlighting on the back which looks pretty awesome in the dark. So this is going to make the alcove a far more pleasant place to sleep in, I would have thought. Thank you so much for watching and following this project. If you enjoyed this and learned some new tips and tricks along the way, please consider subscribing or leaving a comment in the description below. Hope you have a great night. Jochen Vau, no star.